Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining today. Um, we'll let people continue to trickle in this morning, but we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so this is the third session of the Disability Employment Awareness Series. And in the chat box, if you could go ahead and let us know who you are, where you're from, and why you've joined this conversation today. Um, if y'all have caught on to the theme of this week, it was ready to work, ready to hire, and ready to, this should be ready to help. Sorry, there's a typo on the PowerPoint. Um, and so this is our third part of our session for this week. So my name is Morgan Bradley, and I am the Community Outreach Program Manager and Coordinator with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service in partnership with the Texas Council for Developmental Disabilities. And I am joined today with my colleagues from across the state. I have Rosa Gill, who is the South Texas Regional Coordinator, Dr. Shelby Vaughn, the Central Texas Regional Coordinator, Skylar Mueller, the West Texas Regional Coordinator, Andy Crocker, Senior Extension Health Specialist, and Emily Wintermute, our Graduate Student Assistant. Um, so before we get started today, I'll go through a quick overview of the discussion today. Um, so a few Zoom tips and assistance. There are several co-facilitators present today who are all on your screen right now, able to help you with any tech assistance you may have. Um, please keep your mics muted and your videos off during the duration of the presentation. At the end, if we have time during the Q&A, you may be able to come off of your um, mute, come off of mute and be able to speak through your mic. Um, we'll quickly go through some agency overviews, ways you can connect with us, and then the presentation will last approximately an hour and we'll have time for Q&A at the end. All right. So the Texas Council for Developmental Disabilities, or TCDD, is a statewide governor-appointed board that is the only entity in state government solely focused on the needs and interests of individuals with developmental disabilities and their families. TCDD is mandated to provide input on state policy initiatives, build communities through statewide grant projects, and educate and inform the public and leaders on developmental disability issues. For more information, you can visit the link in the chat. Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service is the outreach and community education arm of the Texas A&M system. For its more than 100 year history, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension has worked to help Texans better their lives with practical, applicable learning through a statewide network of trained volunteers, professional educators, and a presence in all 254 counties, as well as the campuses of Texas A&M and Prairie View A&M. When we're done, we can follow up to talk more about both agencies and how we work together to serve the people of Texas. Back in 2019, TCDD partnered with AgriLife Extension to create a regional connection of regional coordinators with a mission to help Texans with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And so there are regional coordinators present throughout the state and a link to connect with your regional coordinator has also been dropped in the chat. If you have heard this spill all week, thank you for staying for the long call and being a part of this series this week. Um, so co-moderating this event with me today is Ms. Rosa Gill. Rosa Gill has been working closely on the topic of disability employment awareness. After participating in several disability employment related events throughout the year and attending several employment coalition meetings, Rosa launched the Disability Employment Awareness Series. Um, back this summer, we featured self-advocates and employer panels in July. And then again, this is the third session of our three-part educational series. And we'll continue this theme of discussing disability employment going forward as well. So Rosa will go ahead and introduce our speaker today, and then we'll get started. Hi, good morning, everybody. And as Morgan had indicated, uh, we are at our third part of our educational series, which is called Ready to Help, Family Supports and Roles for the Job Search. Uh, today we have our presenter, Candace Davis, uh, with Guidepost Workforce Support, LLC. Ms. Davis is a rehabilitation services professional in the Dallas-Fort Worth and surrounding areas and the owner and director of Community Rehabilitation Services Organization. 
Guidepost Workforce Support is under contract with Texas Workforce Solutions uh, through their Vocational Rehabilitation Services Department. Um, Ms. Davis has worked with individuals and families throughout her career where she began working with children ages 18 months to 13 years in Applied Behavior Analysis, ABA, providing early intensive behavioral intervention therapy and life skills training in centers and in the home around the DFW Metroplex. She began working in vocational rehab in 2013, providing supported employment and job placement services to adults of all ages. Currently, Ms. Davis specializes in working with individuals with ASD, which is Autism Spectrum Disorders, uh, the diagnoses, as well as assisting individuals who are deaf or hearing impaired and uh, have recently developed proficiency. And she has recently developed proficiency working with built blind and vision loss customers. She attributes this launch of her career and passion for the field uh, in ABA studies, uh, where she gained a keen understanding of ABA and working uh, with individuals with disabilities and their families. Thank you, Ms. Davis, for uh, presenting on this topic, and you can go ahead and start your presentation. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Thank you very much for the introduction. Let me find the PowerPoint to open here. So as she said, my name is Candace Davis, and I'm happy to have been invited to present today to talk about family supports and different roles for the job search and uh, during employment. So as I said, I, I'm the owner and director of Guidepost Workforce Support. This is a community rehabilitation services provider Go to the next slide here. And we're under contract with Texas Workforce Commission, the VR division, vocational rehabilitation. Uh, under that umbrella, we provide job placement services, supported employment services. We do job skills training and we can uh, conduct environmental workplace assessments. This assessment exists uh, and was created primarily to assist individuals uh, on the autism spectrum. Um, the assessment works to determine what type of environmental factors or challenges may exist for a particular individual prior to beginning the job search. Um, so it can be a really useful tool for people with ASD diagnoses, as well as other developmental delays to be able to foresee um, any potential problems in various environments. So currently we work throughout DFW uh, and surrounding areas. The county is currently served by guideposts are, are Dallas, Collin, Tarrant, Denton, Rockwall, Grayson, Navarro, Hunt, and Ellis. And you can learn more about our services at the website www.guidepostwfsupport.com. So I made a list of some common acronyms that I will mention pretty regularly, most likely, um, and many that we have already mentioned, VR, uh, vocational re rehabilitation. Um, it's the field that uh, I'm currently working in. Uh, I understand there was a TWC presentation yesterday as well. Um, ABA, as I've already mentioned, uh, also is applied behavior analysis. This was um, a minor study for me at, uh, at the University of North Texas, um, which is a really excellent program, uh, very well, um, very reputable in the country for applied behavior analysis. Uh, a BCBA is a board certified behavior analyst. We have a BCBA on our staff um, we don't currently offer ABA services, though we do work with individuals with ASD diagnoses, and uh, we offer that uh, environmental workplace assessment that is targeted for people with a diagnosis as well. <clears throat> and um, we do hope to eventually 
uh, offer ABA services in the future. I wanna talk some about different uh, services or benefits that are available for individuals with disabilities. So I'll talk a little bit about SSDI and SSI, which are the um, income and cash benefit payments uh, offered by the SSA for individuals with disabilities. Um, I wanna talk more about ABA specifically because uh, I'm very grateful for discovering ABA for ending up in the, the program at uh, UNT. Um, I'm very fascinated with the subject and I have found it enormously useful in my own work while I was working with individuals uh, with ASD diagnosis at, in childhood ages. Uh, ABA is the is the science behind um, early intensive childhood intervention therapies. Um, I do continue continuously use the principles within ABA and all of the work that I do. And I find it just enormously useful, like I said. Um, so I, I, I definitely would encourage um, people to look more into ABA uh, if you're interested in learning uh, about working with individuals with disabilities uh, or your teaching in general, it's a, a wonderful field. The major idea is that the basic components of learning are broken down into steps and then we can teach and reinforce for skill acquisition or we can work um, through ABA techniques and strategies to try to decrease unwanted or undesirable or challenging behaviors. So I'm talking today about support members, uh, talking to support members for individuals with disabilities. In VR, we often refer to an individual circle of support. And while a person is receiving services in vocational rehabilitation, we think of their circle of support, including their family members, friends, neighbors, potentially, uh, possibly teachers, um, and then extending out further to the caseworkers in the, in the field, in the VR field, to coworkers uh, once they're on the job. Uh, also peers and support groups um, can be important uh, members within a person's circle of support. We also talk about natural supports in VR. So a natural support is a, a support member that exists naturally in a person's environment. So we were thinking of family, friends, coworkers, but usually not a caseworker because caseworkers their role with an individual is time limited and um, a person's ongoing needs, and I'm thinking primarily in the workplace, is um, those needs should be transferred to another person who does exist and as a natural support prior to the case closing for the caseworker. So in the beginning, if someone's working, they may re rely on a caseworker for many needs, communication-wise, for you know, job coaching, for learning their tasks. And eventually that, that becomes a, an important aspect of a, a job coach's job or a job placement specialist job is to find ways of transferring how we are functioning um, to support someone to someone that is naturally um, going to be in their environment uh, for the long haul. Um, and then the SSA designates another type of group uh, of support members, it's even more narrow and it's for the purposes of de determining SSI benefits, that those are means tested. So that means that 
benefit amount is determined based on the current financial means and the available means. So they'll utilize the financial information from an in-kind support uh, to determine what type of the amount of an SSI benefit check or payment. Um, so in-kind support members are uh, usually family members or, or uh, members in the household or even outside of the household, as long as they're providing some type of financial support in the form of food or shelter. So much of this presentation is likely geared toward people who fall in the in-kind support category. Um, however, the concepts that I wanna talk about are important for certainly caseworkers and it can be important also for other support members um, in a person's life. So as I mentioned, I wanted to touch on social security, disability income, and SSI, supplemental security income, because this could be a, an important resource for families and individuals um, for their financial uh, means, or to meet their financial needs. Um, I wanted to give a brief idea of both of those uh, types of benefits and how to apply um, in case that could be useful for someone or in case someone um, is wondering and I'm able to provide a little bit of insight into that, uh, into those services. So the SSA provides two different kinds of cash benefits, cash benefit payments. Um, the SSDI and SSI qualifying individuals that meet age and disability requirements may receive the insurance benefits. Um, so it's determined based on if a person can't go to work. So SSDI requires that an individual have some qualifying work history. So basically has paid into social security at some point in time in their life. Children can also qualify under a parent's work history uh, after a certain age. And then um, a, spouse, a spouse's work history may also be considered for an individual with a disability. Uh, it's meant to provide cash monthly cash benefit payments uh, in the event that a person is no longer able to work or not able to work as they did prior to having the disability. And then after two months, after 24 months, sorry, two years, the same SSDI benefits recipients of the benefits uh, also qualify for Medicare insurance. Um, so I did mention childhood disab disability payments. So this is um, the insurance program that will provide the cash benefit if an individual is 18 or older, but the disability began before the age of 22, and there is a, a parent that's either collecting Social Security retirement benefits already or SSDI themselves. So they have been able to qualify for the SSDI or SS Social Security retirement benefits, and so the child can as well. Um, over the age of 18. SSI stands for Supplementary Security Income, and this is the monthly cash assistance for older or disabled beneficiaries who have limited income and limited resources. Um, it, it is meant to um, provide assistance with individ for individuals who are not able to meet their basic needs. Um, and there is a benefit eligibility checklist uh, on the ssa.gov website with comprehensive information about how, what, what eligibility requirements there are for supplementary security income recipients. Um, some more information about how to apply and to qualify. Um, the, the disability benefits publication is available online and that will talk about who, who decides if a person is disabled, how that determination is made. Um, and then you can apply for benefits online or over the phone. Those are the two options that exist 
currently. Um, you, we have a, a local SSA office if you prefer to call and do it over the phone. There's an office locator tool on the website as well, and that's how you'll find your local office. So I took the liberty to put down some of the uh, information that is required to apply for either of these benefits. Um, and it's a lot of stuff. So that was my intention was to show that it is a process and they are going to be looking for all of your, your information and um, for, for individuals who may be interested in seeking out this type of service or benefit in the future. Um, I wanted to stress that it is important to keep records of all of these things and to make sure that they're in a, in a place that, that is access, accessible to you and that you can find them. And maybe this will make somebody's process a little more smooth um, if you kind of go into it knowing or understanding what will be expected for the application. So personal information, uh, including your um, birth certificates, your social security card, um, any marriage or divorce dates, um, children, your banking information, medical information, so all of your detailed information about your illnesses, injuries, conditions, who uh, the dates and names of the medical tests were taken, who ordered them, who prescribed your medications, what are your medications. Uh, they want a comprehensive list of your medical information. Your work information, so going back 15 years prior and listing up to five jobs um, prior to being unable to work or having a diminished ability to work. You have a workers comp or had other benefits that you had filed for in the past, like disability insurance or military benefits or retirement. Those, that type of in information will also be needed. And um, so there are some other documents listed, your uh, citizenship status, any discharge papers. If you had military service before 1968, W-2 forms, your medical evidence, doctor's reports, test results, et cetera. Um, and then your pay stubs and settlement agreements, if that applies. Um, so that's another thing that's really important and applicable for working uh, and record keeping is your pay stubs. You wanna be on top of keeping those and especially for the SSA because you have to be reporting your wages when you are a, a, an SSI recipient. Um, some people become in danger of receiving overpayments from the SSA and when those are discovered, then an individual may be at risk of, um, of having their wages garnished or having to repay that overpayment back to the Social Security Administration. So it's a good, it's good practice to keep uh, on top of your pay stubs and to be monitoring your financial situation regularly. So this is um, called a benefits planning query. This is a, a tool used by the SSA and it provides information on your benefits. And it's particular to every person who receives assistance. So it's individualized and it will to give you a comprehensive picture of what your limitations are and how much you're receiving um, with SSD, SSI or SSDI. So it, it'll show you your amount of your cash benefits if you have an overpayment status, um, the dates for medical reviews, what your health insurance status, status may be, um, if you're using any work incentives, that they do offer a work incentive through the program. Um, but importantly, it will we'll talk about, it will show you how your benefits are impacted if you go to work. And that is what will help you make the decision, make really important decisions about your employment, um, whether it is in your best interest to go back to work, whether it's in your best interest to 
work full time and earn as much money as you can and lose your benefits over time. It's, it's um, this planning query exists so that uh, on a case by case basis, individuals can make the best choices for themselves to determine how they can maximize um, these benefits to, to their advantage. So anyone who does receive SSI or SSDI, I um, definitely encourage this benefits planning query to be completed. Uh, so you have a clear picture of, um, of what you, what, how to approach your employment and what your employment needs may be. And um, as someone who's supporting someone with a disability who receives these types of benefits, um, I, I want you to know the, how important this planning query is. And it will help, it will definitely help clear up any confusion there may be about benefits and provide a roadmap um, for how to, to proceed if um, employment is something that you are seeking. So I've mentioned community rehabilitation programs a few times. Uh, Guidepost is a, an organization that provides these types of programs. Um, and there are multiple types. So this could be any program that directly uh, provides vocational rehabilitation services or facilitates the provision of VR services to help individuals with disabilities maximize their opportunities for employment. So there's a lot of different um, examples of ways or programs, organizations, and ways that that is done. Um, there are career advancement or, uh, organizations, um, just going through the list here, medical and vocational services that are under one management. Um, talking about assistive devices or technologies, uh, organizations that make prosthesis and orthotic devices. Uh, we have recreational therapy, speech and occupational therapy, uh, psychiatric and social services, including behavior management, ABA would fall under that category, uh, assessments for determining eligibility and VR needs, rehabilitation technology, orientation and mobility services for people who are blind, and the, the list goes on. So there's a lot of different uh, community providers out there and involved hand in hand with VR services. One uh, very important concept in vocational rehabilitation and for speaking for our, myself, like for guidepost workforce support as, as a central goal and a mission for all of the services that we provide uh, is a person-centered planning approach. Some, from the, B, the VR glossary online, they describe this as a planning process that brings together all the people who are important to the individual, so the circle of support, so that we can identify skills and abilities that can help the individual achieve his or her goals for competitive integrated employment. That's a very important term as well. Uh, for independent living, continuing education, and for full inclusion in the community. So it very much is what it sounds like. A person-centered planning focuses on an individual, and their needs. So it takes an individualized approach. Support needs are done on a case-by-case -case basis for everyone. And um, the job search and the job plan is aligned with that person's skills, abilities, interests, preferences, desires, the bottom line is that there's no cookie cutter um, situation for, for an individual with a disability and, and their employment. For everyone, you start at, at zero and you build, like what is the, the plan that we're trying to make for you? 
I, I'm very wary because I've encountered on occasion situations where I'll find out that a person who's receiving services um, from a provider, maybe a job placement provider, who is trying to place them in a job that they already had for them before they met. Or I'll have, every once in a while I'm asked if I have a job ready for someone. Well, without knowing a person, and um, without having met, made a job plan, meeting the people in their circle of support and understanding what their needs are, the answer is no, I don't have a job lined up for anyone um, before all of those things take place. And then the approach is, is very individualized um, and um, it's, it's going to look completely different for every person. It should. So I would be wary if, if I was receiving services myself and someone said, oh, we already have a job for you lined up you know, upon first meeting. That would raise a red flag for me because we, our charge is to be providing person-centered planning and services. So as I mentioned, competitive integrated employment is a, another really important concept in vocational rehabilitation. And this is also from the VR glossary, uh, all, of, all of this definition here. Um, so I'll go over it uh, because also all of the work that we do needs to end up with this solution. Um, Competitive integrated employment means that work is performed full time or part time. It may be self employment, but an individual is compensated, not less than um, minimum wage, uh, state or federal minimum wage, not less than the rate paid by the employer for the same work for other individuals who are not individuals with disabilities or in, who, who were in similar occupations by the same employer or had the same or similar training experience and skills. If it's self-employment, the competitive integrated employment means they're yielding an income that's also comparable to the income received by other individuals who are not individuals with disabilities. They're also eligible for the level of benefits provided to all other employees. Integrated employment means it's at a location in the community where the person with a disability is interacting with other employees within the work unit and the work site, appropriate to the work performed and other persons who are not individuals with disabilities. This portion is, is describing um, it's what is what is trying to uh, have people avoid is a, a placing people in what are known as enclaves, and it was done a lot in the past. I have found out that not even you know even in the recent past this does exist. But in vocational rehabilitation, we do not find employment in a, in a place where it's only people with disabilities performing this job, uh, separate from everybody else. And nobody else does that job. It's just a job carved out just for people with disabilities and they work together over there. That is not integrated employment. It's not inclusive. We are not in those types of situations. You were not working towards inclusion and, um, and uh, yeah, helping someone achieve that goal of com competitive integrated employment that is something we avoid and discourage others from doing the same thing. We want people to be included in, in society and in the same environments that everyone else. That is what inclusion means. Um, and, then, and then also competitive employment means that they have the opportunity to advance within their field similar to those employees who do not have a disability and their ability to advance as well. So those are the goals that we have for employment for, for any person that we are providing services for. And those are things that you should be looking out for. Are, are 
the needs for competitive integrated employment being met. And being an advocate for a person with a disability means that if you see that this is not the case, then, then it may become your responsibility to, uh, to say something. So there are several um, other important concepts uh, that I want people to consider as you are trying to support somebody with a disability or um, for a person with a disability themselves, and especially for service providers who are working with people with disabilities and their families. So just going down the list here, um, the first term that I think is super important is autonomy. So autonomy is a, an individual's right to self-governance, the capacity to make informed decisions, deciding for oneself, your employment goals, your interests, your preferences, your future, what you do throughout your day, what you do with your money. Um, Allowing a person to exercise their autonomy increases job satisfaction. Makes a lot of sense. If you um, are in a job that you are interested in and you help decide that you want to work there and um, it's aligned with your employment goals and your financial needs, you'll be happier than if <laughs> those situations were not the case. And if you were not involved in making that choice for yourself. And unfortunately it happens a lot. Um, and then advocacy goes hand in hand with that. And uh, we talk about self-advocacy and self-determination in vocational re rehabilitation. We encourage self-advocacy. We teach uh, individuals that we work with how to advocate for themselves and then often become advocates for other individuals when trying to implement accommodations in the workplace, when um, trying to uh, apply or, or talk about a person's um, ability to work in, in, a in a situation where someone may not recognize they can do so, um, it becomes a responsibility of ours in, in a service provider role to um, to raise awareness and to introduce these accommodating or accommodation uh, ideas that could um, remove the barriers or challenges for somebody with a disability in the workplace. So one important tool for advocacy is educating yourself and understanding the disability. Um, and that way you can raise awareness and provide information that will, um, that could help somebody achieve what their needs are in a workplace. Um, having awareness of an individual's interests or concerns is also very important. This goes with autonomy. Um, Sometimes communication barriers exist. Uh, and so it is important for us to do what we can to understand what are an individual's uh, needs and interests. We want to hear their voice. We want their, their voice and their, their needs to be heard. And then so sometimes it takes thinking outside of the box to make sure that we are understanding what that individual's um, interest, concerns may be. And knowing where they need help. Um, I'm thinking of the environmental workplace assessment because it's an excellent tool that does exactly that. It can help remove some of the barriers of language and communication and provide some insight to what types of environments a person may need or what type of help they may need in an environment or environments they may need to be avoided. Um, 
I think that assessment is an excellent tool for advocacy in general. Um, and then as just as understanding somebody's interests and concerns, understanding what their individual challenges and abilities are, and understanding that there are ways of accommodating challenges and having an understanding of how to do so or how to learn how to do so is really important. Also, um, depending on if you're working with a person or if you're supporting a person that is um, that is coming from a different culture, has different religious beliefs, it is also very important that we have an understanding of those uh, cultural and religious needs and that we are sensitive to those as well. Uh, informed choice is should be talked about in vocational rehabilitation to all of the customers who we're providing services for. An informed choice really means that the people that are that you're receiving services from, the service providers uh, through VR uh, or or other types of services, um, you have the right to make that choice and you have the right to have as much information as you can so that you can make a good choice. So if you are asked by your counselor, you know, who do you want to work with you? Here are some, here's a list, here's a few different providers I'm aware of that are currently working, currently taking customers, we've got, we've got some uh, relationship built with them. Um, take that initiative, and if the support support members also, it's important to take that initiative and give those folks a call. Have a conversation with them. You can determine a lot from a conversation. Um, oftentimes, especially a, su a support person, a service person, you can kind of get a good feel for how how are we communicating. How is um, is this, you know, does it seem like we are able to um, get along? You know, are, are we, is this gonna be somebody I would be happy to work with in the future? And you can learn a lot from that initial conversation. So I think even minimally just that, uh, instead of kind of arbitrarily picking someone to provide services, um, you, wanna, you want to feel good about the people that you're receiving services from. And not, not all service providers are equal. Um, unfortunately, um, there will always be a greater need for quality services than there are quality services available. Um, but uh, to be an advocate um, and a self-advocate, potentially, if you are seeking services yourself, um, it is important to make that informed decision about who your service providers are. And it is your choice. That's the bottom line for, for this idea is that the, the person who is receiving services does get to make the determination, the determination who they receive services for. And if they're unhappy or displeased, they can also request a different service provider. Um, and I would encourage them to do that if they feel like their needs are not being met uh, and especially if they feel like their voice uh, is not being heard and they're not being allowed autonomy. Um, communication is so important. Goes without saying, um, but for support people in supporting professions, um, in somebody's circle of support, uh, recognizing uh, potential language barriers and working to try to remove those barriers is an ongoing part of the job and, and of a person's responsibilities if you're supporting somebody who has a, some barriers with communication. So you may have language barriers or 
uh, for a hearing impaired person that that their first language is ASL. There, there does exist some barrier for clear communication in with English speakers. And so if you're a support person, it might be important to recognize that at an early age that English is the language here that we all use to work together and uh, function in society. And for people who have a different first language, understanding that uh, the more tools that we can give them to become more proficient with English um, is only going to help them later on in life and when they are going to become more independent and go to work and be on their own and in a surrounding or in some in surroundings where English is used instead of so that's just one example um, additionally I think of um, language barriers that exist for people who are nonverbal we are very fortunate in this day, day and age that we have at our disposal, we have access to equipment and technologies, communication programs, apps on our phone that, that uh, can help to remove communication barriers. Um, I'm a very, I have a bit of a personal story, um, but I'm very, very grateful for the existence of communication programs on iPads for people who, uh, they, at one point, people thought they would never have a voice, and these technologies are giving voice to people who were not able to express themselves previously, and um, it's life-changing, and it's amazing. Um, so if you are supporting somebody where uh, verbal communication is a challenge, uh, I definitely encourage you to look for whatever resources may be available. Um, you can have assistive technology assessments completed. There are organizations that exist that will help uh, determine what kind of type of adaptive equipment may, might be useful and help implement them um, in a person's life or surroundings or on the job, et cetera. Um, I think of a communication app as well. I work with individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing and there are just text-to-speech apps um, like this closed captioning. Um, and that will allow somebody who otherwise may have no ability to understand what's, what is being communicated in the workplace, for example. And now, you know, especially with the use of maps, if they're, if they're lip readers, well, now there's another barrier we've, we all have to contend with now. So now this app on your phone can write out the conversation that's being had around you. And that to me is such a, a great uh, advancement for our society that that exists for people. Um, there's also picture exchange communication systems. So prior to having uh, fancy technologies and equipment and apps. This was a communication system for nonverbal individuals who uh, could learn through ABA and uh, techniques, uh, different techniques and strategies, how to um, communicate their needs by exchanging pictures. And this is still used in the workplace. It is, uh, there, this is an accommodation that can be created for an individual, um, which might look like I have, uh, I have to clean a lobby. And um, these are the steps that we have to do during the day to clean the lobby. The first thing we do is go get the mop and then we have to fill the mop bucket with water. And, and then we have to, um, you know, drive the mop bucket to the bathroom and, and then we mop. So there are pictures of each step and a, a person can um, refer to their picture 
a booklet. Usually we can create a little picture booklet on a, on a key ring and they can be the fit, complete a step and having a hard time knowing what to know, what to do next. They can refer to this uh, picture book and see, oh, this is the next step of the process. For individuals who are supporting people with disabilities who may have communication barriers, handling communication yourself may become your responsibility. Um, at, in the workplace, I encourage support members, family members to establish some line of communication with a person's employer. Um, I don't think there's ever gonna be anything wrong with that. You, you, will be the first you know, emergency contact likely, you'll be the first person called in the event of a problem. So it's good to establish that line of communication and help support an individual with communicating with their employer. If someone's going to be late or if they need to call um, into work or if they need to request time off, these are all things that uh, a person within, a, within the circle of support can uh, can help with in, in regards to communication. So disclosure of a person's disabilities is another important topic. Uh, anyone has a right to disclose or not to disclose the presence of a disability. It is completely an individual's choice. I want to stress this because I, um, I don't want people to ever feel like they have been pressured to disclosing a disability when they don't want to, and to understand that if their disability is disclosed and they haven't provided that permission to do so, well, that's a violation of your rights. Um, and that's a pretty serious thing. There's a lot of reasons why you may not want to disclose a disability, or there may be reasons why you, you need to disclose a disability. I hear in vocational rehabilitation that if someone needs an accommodation that they have to disclose a disability. I don't know if I'd agree that they have to. I would, usually when I have a conversation with somebody about disclosure, I inform them that if you are needing an accommodation that it was important on, you know, for, for, your, to be, for you to be successful, uh, in the workplace, then your employer, your supervisor may need to know why. Um, but there's a little gray area too, because I think you can request an accommodation and not have to say exactly why you need that. But, um, and for some time, sometimes it's not an, a problem. People want uh, others to know so that they can be sensitive to a person's needs or what the situation is, but it, it is absolutely a person's choice whether or not they tell anybody about their disability. That's a very, very important concept that I want to stress to everybody, including service providers out there. Um, there are, in the workplace, there is a lot of discrimination to this day. Unfortunately, I see it a lot. And People discriminate when they hear the word disability sometimes. So it's hard to know when you go into a situation whether or not talking about a disability will bring discrimination upon you. So it's a very, uh, it's a pretty heavy um, decision that you have to make sometimes depending on your case and situation. And fiscal responsibility also is a really important um, umbrella for, for individuals who are supporting someone with a disability, teaching responsible money management, um, how to save, how to budget, what you can spend money on, what you can't spend money on. Uh, those are those are pretty difficult things to teach, um, but it's important. But also if a person's working, you know, we, 
if we're fortunate, we get the working people get the opportunity to buy the things that they want. So I, I say this because I uh, have seen people who are working spend their money on, on some things that maybe a support member doesn't approve of. Um, and that has to be decided on a case by case basis too. You know, what, what are your financial needs? Do you have disposable income? Um, can we budget for, for more things that you want? But importantly, allowing somebody to have that reinforcement for their work. I worked, I earned this money, and now I get to reap the benefits of working, which is buying something that I want. It's really, really important. Um, that is pretty much the driving factor of of working for most people. So we want to be able to allow people to enjoy that. Um, and then also, as mentioned earlier, all of the, the benefit options with SSI, with SSDI, uh, child disability payments, um, and that benefits query, these are all really important tools if you decide to try to pursue those benefits. Um, it's, it's a lot of work to navigate and, and there are resources available to help you do so. So um, one of the last things I wanna talk about um, some more uh, our accommodations and adaptive equipment and support. Um, having a job coach provided through vocational rehabilitation services is an accommodation needing an interpreter or a translator to understand the job policies, procedures, the, all the training material, that's an accommodation. Um, we've talked about adapt adaptive technologies, devices, equipment. Uh, there are a lot of different things that can be implemented in a person's environment to help them with work, and depending on what their disability is and what their individual needs are. Um, so these, there are these assessments I mentioned earlier for adaptive equipment, um, and that might be a really important resource for how to really find the best equipment available to us at, at this time, and it's constantly improving, and, and as technology, um, as technologies advance, they, they are only getting better and more creative, and there's a, a lot of really cool tools at our disposal now. Um, environmental modifications as well. So you, you may have to request that uh, something at work be altered so that a person can access their workspace or something like that. That's an example of an environmental modification or accommodation uh, or something as simple as you know, maybe somebody has a hard time standing throughout their work shift and they need a chair. That's a very simple environmental modification um, that can be reasonably accommodated by any employer. Uh, requesting accommodations in the workplace may be uh, another area where support members need to step in. Um, it's a, definitely a way of advocating for someone and their needs. We request accommodations all the time for people. Uh, I usually use the language uh, when talking about a potential opportunity for people. I definitely will use the language. Uh, uh, do you think they will be able to perform that task with a re with a reasonable accommodation? This should be this should flag an employer for. Um, for really the uh, for anti -dis discrimination laws, um, they should not be able to deny you even consideration if you request a reasonable accommodation under the ADA. That that is um, by law the their requirement is to be able to hire people and not discriminate if someone is able to provide 
is able to perform the work with or without a reasonable accommodation. So JAN is another acronym. This stands for the Job Accommodation Network. It's a resource that exists where you can learn about all types of different accommodations that might exist. And um, JAN uh, Associates can help you navigate what accommodations may work for you and uh, or the person that you're supporting. Um, and then there's uh, also assistive technology services, different community re rehabilitation organizations that will also can also help to do assessments and determine what types of assistive technologies um, someone might be able to use and benefit from in the workplace or at home. So here's the definition from the glossary for assistive technology devices. So any item, equipment, system, either acquired, commercially modified or customized, used to increase, maintain, or improve the functional capacities of individuals with disabilities. So some more considerations uh, that I briefly want to uh, touch on are uh, raising awareness in general, at educating the public, educating employers about different disabilities and accommodations. Um, this is this is all of our jobs. This is our responsibility as, as people who are are in this field or are, are sensitive to the needs of individuals with, with disabilities. Raising awareness um, is super important. Uh, I find that employers who are doing their best not to discriminate sometimes even they don't realize that we can we can work together to make accommodations um, work for an individual and benefit everybody. And teaching them that uh, and educating employers uh, is exciting and um, really is, it's a snowball effect. Like they, they'll continue to educate the people around them and their employees and your coworkers, staff members. Um, and hopefully like, like a ripple effect, like it, it will continuously um, keep giving if we're working to raise awareness altogether. Um, and then, and I mentioned earlier service uh, oversight. Um, if you're receiving services of any type, um, you may not be, there, there may come times when you're not receiving the services to your liking or your needs aren't being met, your case may be neglected or worse, God forbid. Um, and this is responsibility for support members as well as um, service providers and for individuals themselves. Um, make sure you understand what's happening in your case and uh, know what decisions are being made and be cognizant if choices are being taken away from you being made for you because those are those are not um, working under these uh, this idea or this charge to do person-centered planning and and uh, allowing people to make their own choices and have autonomy and be able to express themselves and their needs we talked about different records for Social Security Administration, um, as well as for VR services for, for many other needs. Um, keeping records is super important, and this might be an area where someone needs assistance and a support member can um, help them do that. Um, keep their records um, on file and in a place that's accessible. Um, especially if you're getting benefits through the SSA, you want to make sure you have those records, you wanna have those pay stubs and you wanna be on top of the benefits so that you're not you know, going into the danger of being overpaid and having to pay that back. But um, in that same vein with record keeping, another thing that's really important is identity protection. And we're in a society where we get scam calls every day and the most vulnerable populations are elderly and people with disabilities. So 
definitely having some oversight in a person's internet use, and teaching ways to uh, understand when it when when you may be the victim of a scam attempt, um, and then just protecting identity, keeping information confidential, not sharing important uh, numbers, such as account numbers and social security numbers online or through a picture, um, keeping those records stored in a safe place this is also very important. Okay, and then we can talk a little bit about the roles for family members or support, support people. When you were searching for work, um, you were always welcome to do networking on your own. Uh, I've helped people who finally got their jobs because their dad talked to somebody and said, hey, I need, you know, my daughter needs a job. Um, so networking works. It's definitely something that I would encourage support members to do. Um, and then if you're receiving services through VR for uh, employment, and you have a caseworker on the case, keep that communication with them and you know, maintain communication. It's very important you will likely be asked to communicate on a weekly basis at the very least. Um, and if any pr problems occur, caseworkers are on your side. We're here to work through problems with you and, um, and come up with solutions. So definitely making sure that you are in communication regularly with your caseworkers is important. And then you may have um, items that a caseworker asks for you to complete or your counselor or items for an employer. Make sure that you're following through on your assignments that you're get, being given, the expectations, the things that um, are important for job acquisition, um, for, for getting the job. You know, there's a reason somebody's asking you for, for this stuff. Um, and then nowadays, everything is online. Uh, we, most applications are online and job searching is done through different websites um, and different job seeker resources. And it's only becoming more complicated to log in and set up a profile and sign back into your account. And so that's an area where I see a lot of breakdown. And I think that's an area where support members can really step up and assist. So helping somebody monitor their own email if they're receiving electronic communication and making sure that they are completing the, the things that are being asked for that are employment related. They're coming through your email, you have to do online. You have to do um, new hire paperwork on online portals now. It, it really is only becoming more complicated and therefore it's kind of creating challenges and barriers for a lot of individuals. Um, so that's definitely an area where circle of support members can step in and assist. And then finally, allow your service provider to facilitate the hiring process. Allow them to do their job. Um, and it is on a case-by-case -case basis as well. I, I have encountered individuals or family members who they are so willing to go to work and help the person on the job with them in whatever capacity they have to. Well, that's not really the role of a family member. If you're receiving VR services, the job coach can do that. The job coach is aware of um, what their policies are, what their expectations should be in the workplace. They're aware of uh, issues like um, disclosure or if somebody doesn't want to disclose or how to, how to approach a situation if certain questions are asked by employers or staff members. You, you, can, you probably wouldn't be surprised the kind of questions you get from um, employers who, or staff members who just wanna know what's going on. Um, and if you're not disclosing information about a disability and you don't necessarily want to disclose, even if you are willing to disclose, you may not want to disclose to everybody. Um, so job coaches and 
support professionals understand how to navigate that diplomatically uh, when, when asked maybe challenging questions about an individual. But even though I would say you're not likely to go a mom or dad or brother probably shouldn't be a job coach for somebody at work. There are a number of other ways that you can support somebody. Um, as I mentioned earlier, establishing that line of communication with your staff, especially with your supervisors for lots of important needs um, like communicating if you need time off or not feeling well or could be late. Um, communication is important so that the employer knows that they have a reliable employee and if something were to go awry or go wrong, that uh, they they know that they will will be in communication about that. Uh, we talked about raising a disability awareness, teaching about an individual or specific type of disability and specific needs that a person may have. Uh, that is definitely a way to support someone at work, helping them. Um, learn responsible money management, SSA wage reporting, record keeping, and then satisfaction checks. I think I want to, to let people know that um, oftentimes someone's working and may, may not really be able to express themselves fully but still may be really dissatisfied in what's happening in their own lives. So if that's the case, and maybe someone doesn't have the ability to express themselves all you know, fully or, or to the best of their ability, then um, check in with them and make sure that they are still enjoying the work or still finding the fulfillment that they need through employment. Well, I think I've gone over my time, so I, um, I think I can wrap up there for today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I was just gonna ask if she had a few minutes for questions. Yes, absolutely. Okay, let me pop out of here and get over here. Um, are there multiple types of employment assistance contractors? I asked because a contractor met my daughter at her grad school and the first step was to give her a reading test and a making change test in grad school. It went downhill from there. She needed skills such as when to ask your workplace for an accessible workspace, example, accessibility for a wheelchair. So I'm wondering if there are different types of contractors. I think I understand your question. There are uh, multiple different types of contractors for sure. Different types of services exist. Um, and if we're talking about school, that those are different types of providers than people who provide employment types of services. An employment service provider may only offer one or two types of services and then another provider may offer all of them or, or more. So yes, there are, there's a wide array of different types of providers. Um, there are really large service providers um, where maybe internal oversight is kind of not as easy to maintain as it might be for a small service provider. It's, it's offering more personalized services. So I would say, yes, there's, there are definitely different types. Thank you. Linda, did that answer your question? Um, thank you. So if a provider would say to you, I don't have any jobs uh, for people with physical disabilities. I only have jobs for people whose bodies work well, then you're in the wrong, that's the wrong fit, right? And you should go back to who and say, I need a different service provider. Sure. What's that chain? Sure. So I would like to start by saying that 
and under TWC, the Texas Workforce Commission's policies and like our uh, responsibilities, they they state that uh, under the American Disabilities Americans with Disabilities Act that anyone with a disability is capable of work. So if a service provider is telling you we only can we only work or can find work for certain types of people, that is completely against the the um, Disabilities Act that we all work under. So if you are receiving services from vocational rehabilitation, you work with a counselor through TWC and the counselor is sort of um, an administrative role over the service providers. So if the service provider is the person telling you we can't work with this person, we can't find a job for this person, then fire them. <laughs> I would say, go to your counselor and say, I'm not happy with these services. I don't think that they're gonna be able to meet our needs. Can we find a new service provider? And there's a ton of service providers in Texas. Um, and as I said earlier, um, if they give you a list, have a conversation with them before you make that choice of who you wanna go with. Thank you. And then we have, with your focus on self-determination and right sizing opportunities to meet the goals needs of the person, what can self-advocates and supports expect in terms of timeline from expressing an interest in employment to day one of a job? So that's a difficult question to give a concrete answer to. And I'm glad that you asked, because I did want to address something similar as well. Um, I would say nine times out of 10, if somebody wants a job and they really do want to work, um, and if they were working with me, for example, or our organization or organizations I've worked with in the past, um, nine times out of 10, we can find them a job. I have worked with individuals for up to two years and a job was never found. That is a rare case. It does not happen very often, but it does happen. We work with individuals who um, have the designation under TWC that they have the most significant challenges for uh, supported employment services. That's that specific supported employment um, is, is designated for people with the most significant challenges. That's how the language is. So there's not really a hard and fast rule of what to expect with a timeline. When you go into TWC originally to even become qualified or apply to become qualified for services, that process can take a long time. And then when, once you get to your service provider, depending on the service that you're getting, there are milestones that we are required to achieve prior to someone becoming employed. Now those can be met within a couple of weeks and it's important to work with your service provider. Um, if you want those, that process to go by quickly, um, then likely you can work with your provider to do so. A lot of the times it's really coming from the motivation of the job seeker, how involved they are really will determine how quickly, often will determine how quickly they are able to get a job, but that's not always the case. Um, it can take months, it can take up to a year sometimes to find a job and, and it's a case by case basis. If you are looking for a very specific type of job and you, you have your heart set on this one type of thing, well, that might make it more difficult. Or if your parameters for when you can work or things like that are, are limited and the, the, the smaller, the more we limit the case and it, can make things more difficult and can lengthen the process. Does that answer your question? Give them just a few minutes to respond. Andy, did that answer your question? Yes. 
Yes. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Candice, for your presentation today. And we are um, a little bit over time. If y'all have any more questions, um, feel free to drop drop them in the chat and we can still follow up with Candace afterwards. Um, I do want to just highlight a last a couple of last few items before we head out. Um, if you could please see the link in the chat for our evaluation link. I will also send it to all attendees today. Um, by completing this evaluation link, you help with us to be able to figure out um, our future topics of choice and to be able to give good feedback to Candace as well. Um, other than that, an upcoming event that I wanted to highlight is the um, Disability Policy Academy hosted by our partner TCDD. Um, this will color, cover the disability count census results and the impact of redistricting on the people with um, developmental disabilities. That link to register has been dropped in the chat as well. And then if you need to contact myself or Rosa, our emails are also in the chat box. Um, thank you all again for attending today. And thank you, Candice, for providing a lot of really great information um, for those of us who work closely with people with um, disabilities or provide um, support, care, and things like that. This was very vital um, to the process of job seeking. So thank you so much for your presentation today. You're welcome. Thank you. And